Chapter two. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, so now we're getting into chapter two. Um, and chapter two is an interesting one uh, because this is uh, one of those ones that I think even in, in trying to figure out what I would write for this story, uh, for the story of this proverb, I, 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 I probably struggled a bit and then didn't struggle <laughs> because I, I, the idea came right away. Uh, but then I, I just wasn't sure about it. And then after a while, I became sure about it. So the, the proverb itself is, um, And the English translation is, Can you ask a dog if it is dressed? I think what I struggled with is, like in Bemba, it makes sense. In English, it, it kind of like, it's a question of like, can you ask a dog if it is dressed? But it's also like, lost in translation somewhere of like what is the dog and w w what does this mean what is this question yeah uh, yeah because I, I, I was curious about that i was like okay i get the dog like i know a bit about it but i'm curious you know you said it in bemba it would be richer do, do you mind kind of like trying to color in a bit <laughs> yeah 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 um because i guess one, dogs are man's best friend, so here we are. Um, but in, in, the, in, in the Bemba proverb itself, it, it kind of like, can, like, there's more deeper meaning to when I say, can you ask a dog? It's also one of those of like, are you serious? That, mm. That's the way, it, like, if you say it, it's that type of thing of like, are you seriously asking a dog if it's dressed? You know, oh. <laughs> that's that's the tonation, maybe, but you cannot put that tonation in in mm. writing as a question. But that it it's kind of like looking at you of like, really? Are you serious? Mm. Of course, dogs don't dress up in clothes. Like, why would you even ask that? Would you like go and like, hey, dog, are you wearing clothes? Yeah. Like, for you to ask that question, there's something wrong <laughs> with you because. You can obviously tell one dogs don't wear clothes, yeah. but also in, in the way nature is, it's obvious that mm. dogs don't wear clothes. So why would you be asking that question? Um, yeah. So that's like, the depth of that is like, that's it. It, it. It's more kind of like looking at you as the person and going, why would you actually ask this question? Like mm -hmm. you can literally see in front of you that this is very obvious. Um, yeah. 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 And so no. that's why like the, the struggle was more in like, how do I bring this across as it, it, it's more around if something is obvious, mm. why would you ask about it? Yeah. You know? But, but then that's, that, that's that the is, question about the obviousness, right? Yeah. Like, is it? Is it yes, <laughs> <laughs> and that's why the dog is is, is a great analogy in, in yeah. the essence of you know this particular chapter of you know apparently it's not obvious because they are poodles, they are <laughs> pugs, they are greyhounds. <laughs> uh, uh, no, this is this is so good. Like I'm loving it because. Um, and surprisingly, like, you know, the, the question that came to me, you know, <laughs> the, about the purpose of language is very much in alignment because it's all about that whole <clears throat> translation. Right. And <laughs> I had a very long conversation with someone, you know, uh, probably at the, uh, the start of the year. And it was all, you know, going into the whole language thing that, you know, we chatted about earlier, but bringing it back to this. For me, what this reminds me of is like, I have, I have this thing, like if, if something is in your reality, like in your here and now, mm. that is as obvious as it's ever going to get. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's obvious to you that this is the yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah, and it's only obvious to you because yes. because your reality is just yours. 
Yeah. Uh, now I know. Yeah, we do live in a shared reality, and we do that. That is true. But also, we do have the private reality where we process and understand everything that's going on in our own language of experience. That's what I call it. I call it our language of experience. And but I do think like that's where that uh, incongruence comes from. It's like all of a sudden, in your in your perspective, in your wonderful, beautiful mind, in your reality where you've been this whole time, where you see things from. This thing makes sense in one way, yeah. And all of a sudden, with the other people in this very shared moment, it does not. Doesn't. And then reality breaks. And then everything <laughs> breaks. And then yeah. everything breaks. And you bring like a, a really good reality check, even for myself, because over the years, my. I, I want to feel like my stance on language, especially in the context of migrating to Australia, has changed and evolved to be more graceful. It used to be very combative. <laughs> and I, I feel like, you know, chapter two m- might also come from my combative years. Um, but what you mentioned there around m- the language experience of like, I would just get so surprised when people are like, your English is good. And I'm like, but why shouldn't it be? Like, literally, that was the question I would ask myself. I'm like, but why shouldn't it be? I've been learning English since grade one. English was my favorite subject. I used to get high marks in English. So I'm like, wait, what is your reality that thinks there's no English in my world? Like, Mm -hmm. who the hell is that? (laughs) (laughs) Yes, in their reality, it's like, you do not fit the category of English speaking people. That... <laughs> and it, it took me a long time, you know, like I was really humbled. I was like, what? I was aspiring to this my whole life. You know, yes! you, you go back home with, you know, my dad bought me a, a Scrabble board because I was struggling with spellings. And yeah. we played a lot of Scrabble and really, you know, with a dictionary and you really worked on having good English. So right? much. So, and so then, much. You know, and then, then you got the good English and now it's being questioned. Yeah, and questioning <laughs> your whole reality of like, wait, h- how is this a question? Why would you even think that? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's hilarious. It, it's so hilarious because like, A few, I think a couple of years when we just moved here, you know, it kept, you know, it kept happening, right? Like, you know, you meet Mm -hmm. other other colleagues and you, you wonder, does it happen? And everybody says it happens. And then this one time, I mean, this Uber being driven by um, an African guy, I think he was uh, from Congo or something. And he's telling me his story and his English was actually not good. Yeah, I could tell because <laughs> well, I, I'd already been told I had good English, <laughs> but on top of that, I could. I mean, if you have good English, you can tell English that's not good. But I digress. Anyway, so he, which we're having this conversation. I'm asking, you know, how long he's been around, and uh, he tells me his struggles. And when he got here, he could only speak French because he comes from a French-speaking <laughs> African yeah. country, no yeah. English. And yeah. then the first year of his life, he was learning English and it was such a struggle. And he's happy that he's, he's learned it now and he's doing great because now he can speak to other people. Yeah. He can get English speaking jobs. And, you know, I'm, I'm throwing a bit of a dilemma because I'm like, uh, when do I tell him that he still has to? <laughs> he still has a long way to go, right? <laughs> but, the Probably not. not yet. Keep going. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> but I'm like, okay, okay. Maybe but it, it humbled me, but and, and I really yes. started to understand what the the natives, you know, the ones who only speak English as <laughs> the only language they know and uh, have seen and have stereotyped people who speak it to be a certain way. I got where they were coming from. I was like, Oh, so when they met somebody who couldn't speak English, they were surprised 
they, they, they sort of stereotypes like okay all people who look this way like do not style. speak yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah and so that's yeah. why it was a surprise for them that i could actually understand what they were saying and speak back in a way that they understood it was very a bit of a, a take back moment for them but on the other hand it also made me realize that however much I thought my English was good, it really wasn't because then I had an accent. Mm. <laughs> and then I never good. thought I never yeah. thought of myself as having an accent. I'm like, what yeah. do you mean I have an accent? Yeah. And then you say something, then you have to repeat yourself, then you have to repeat yourself, then till later you get it as oh it's my accent. Now I apologize for my accent. Like sorry, yeah I, I do have an accent. This is how I say things. Uh this is what I meant. Uh figure it out. <laughs> Yeah, and that's the interesting part as well. I actually think about two things that have come to me with, with, with your point about the accent is one. And also, like, this is why I've moved from combat zone into more graceful zone. But I think there's a worldliness about where you grow up and the languages that you have. So aside from, from English... Me growing up, I grew up in Zambia and Zimbabwe, so I kind of like picked languages all over. And so you could, in Zambia anyway, you, you can tell even from sometimes, um, especially if like they're, they're in different regions of the country by their accent, you can tell this region, this region, that type of thing. And again, like their accent becomes a power play. Yeah. Because... People, even in the context of the African context, if you mix your L's and your R's, we're going to laugh at you. Yeah. We're just going to fall down and laugh at you, which is a bad thing. <laughs> because some people in their languages, in their local languages, don't have an L, don't have an R. They don't yeah. have an H. So everything instead of home, it's OM. You know, yep. like not yeah. saying they can't pronounce home. It's just that there's no H in their native language. Yeah. So they'll say OM. <laughs> Um, and, and so for me, like, I think language has these fascinating bits to it. And if you're more worldly, you become more graceful because mm. you can tell even like if somebody has a French background when they're learning English, they, we can say their English is not that good, yeah. but they're trying their best in their French, <laughs> French nativity type of thing. Right. And, and, and you're kind of like. If you're worldly, you give them more grace. Mm -hmm. If you haven't had the worldly chance to hear even different accents, different languages being spoken, I feel like you fall in the trap of just like, ah, do better. Like, these people don't know English because you, your ears are not attuned. You yeah. know, I'm not saying my ears are the best, but because my ears, I've heard so many accents, sometimes I just give a bit more grace to be like, can you repeat that? Mm, mm. <laughs> Whereas other people just dismiss it right away and just go, no, you didn't make sense. You don't know English. But actually yeah. you didn't give them the time to articulate it and switch your ears to, uh, like you need the delta, like 98.5, <laughs> move it to 99.2. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's very it's very good, the point you touch on there. And, I, and it reminds me of, uh, uh, they called it... Uh, it's been like it's very common these days in in you know on conversations and uh podcasting in the podcasting land so they'll call it uh some will call it rule omega mm. so there's what they call rule omega but other people will call it steel mining uh but the, the concept is that you know like instead of uh it's so, sort of like an active listening technique mm. but also like uh more like a, a graceful, dialogical type thing. But what, what it says is that you should try and articulate back to the person what they said in a, in a way that makes it stronger than even they meant it mm. to the point that they appreciate you filling in the gaps that they had in their thought and then take your version of it. If you, yeah. can, if you can do that for them, uh, they will appreciate that, and they will want to do the same for you. Yeah. And and so the 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 task is the the working assumption is that in whatever everybody said, 
like there's probably going to be about 20% sense and 80% noise. And yeah. you, the person listening, you have the job to filter out the noise and find that 20% uh, yeah, and, yeah. and take it out. But, but going to that bit of like, you know, when you're describing what would happen like back home, like, you know, growing up in school or somebody, you say you, you make a mistake and somebody laughs at you and you don't want to be laughed at. And so if somebody's looking to laugh at you, they're, they're not going to do that. And so yeah. it just, it just makes it uh, a, a struggle. But then if you also learn the language as a trophy to kind of go like, yeah, look, I got it. I guess like then we suffer in the way we both suffer. It's like English is, <laughs> your English is good. It's like, why should it not be good? I am this trophy. What are you talking about? I worked for this. And then, then you're put in a place of like, mm, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I saw this a while ago. Um, from what is it called? I, I'm gonna say it's professional migrant women. They, they had a campaign going, and the campaign was like, "My accent is my superpower." Um, and, and I loved that campaign, and I, I loved it from the perspective of like what I was saying of like, I think. A lot of the times we will then have our accents and our accents evolve because of, you know, where we are, the people we're interacting yeah. with and da, da, da. Um, but there's accents in the world that are privileged accents, nice accents, you know, American, English accents. Um, Australian is not one of them, let's be honest. <laughs> What are you uh, saying, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, 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 I, I love that because I was like, it's a superpower uh, because even as your accent evolves because of where you're staying, sometimes people actively change their accents just so they can show their, mm. their superiority, their, their betterness, you know, their, their, their worldliness and yeah. da, da, da. But you can actually be worldly with your accent you can be worldly with your power of language hmm. in where you are and if you can articulate yourself in a clear fashion people understand you you, you get to influence people you get to be impactful keep your accent mate <laughs> yeah yeah totally and and i think it's it goes to you know learning to be a good communicator like once you learn how to be a good communicator you find that language accent all those barriers are no longer a problem because uh, like you now know how to wield that you know that device of of language you you can yeah. slow down when you need to uh you can go faster if you need to you can tweak like there's a way to to make sense to everyone and it's so amazing. Like my wife used to laugh at me when I started to do this. Like, you know, you, yeah. you'd be on this call, right? And uh, you're speaking to somebody like maybe for some service, you know, those where you have to wait on the call for some mm. time. And they're asking you to, to tell them your name and you'll say your name once. And then they'll say, no, I don't get it. And then you spell it out. Yeah. But even when you spell it out, that's not enough. But you have now to spell it with references. It's like N. <laughs> for nut, Y <laughs> for yellow, A for ant. <laughs> and you go all the way through your name, referencing the, which letter you mean, uh, because they really can't get it. And yeah. they really appreciate it when you do that for them. And then, you know, you've overcome the barrier, but it's the willingness to work with them yes, to get to a point of understanding. And, and the point of understanding is not using the correct word or using the correct, yeah, no, no, no. you know, whatever. It, it's using just the thing that you both go, okay, I get yes. what you were saying there. Yeah. Which is, and, and that, that is the point of language to communicate yeah. the meaning, right? Yeah. <laughs> as long as you can transmit the meaning, that's all that matters. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Um, so what we've concluded is <laughs> because there are different breeds of dogs, <laughs> It's not that obvious. No, it's not. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. This oh, is amazing. Yeah. This is so much obvious. fun. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the power in, in the language is actually attuning 
yourself to to kind of like be graceful or also just um put in some patience mm-hmm. but also accept the, the the different characteristics of human languages and human experiences yeah. so you can be like okay i'm gonna be more graceful and listen but also like when i listen and tell the person back then they are also going to do the same and we yeah. find the point where we actually get the message across whatever we're trying to communicate because that's yeah. the key right whatever we're trying to communicate is the most important thing yeah and, and once you can get through to the other person how you got there at the end of the day doesn't really that's- matter and and you would notice this like in people who've been you know st- strong long-term relationships you know, like it, they say this in the in the Aboriginal here, they call it the dreaming, right? Mm. And part of that is uh, you've been resonating with these people so long, you know them to a point whereby you, you, you're past language, like you've gone beyond language in that you can get what they mean almost remote, yes. right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Energies have now kind of like synced together that yeah. you just you know yeah. uh, you get through that barrier of even language because it is a barrier oh yes and and you 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 know you once you surpass that barrier of language the other side i promise you is just amazing because like from my own experience like when you know in my marriage when we got beyond that it's amazing that let's say when my wife makes a mistake in her articulation of you know she misspeaks or she misreferences something i no longer get lost in the mistake or in the misreference because i know i have enough historical data mm-hmm. to correct for the mistake uh, you know she go like oh uh you know like back home we use a lot of referencing of uh yes. brand names for things yeah, it's like yeah, yeah. oh Pass me the Colgate. It's like, yes, oh, she means Colgate. It's toothpaste. <laughs> she yes. means toothpaste. So now yeah, yeah, we just yeah. say, can you just call it by its correct name? You know, in the early years, but now it's more like yeah. the graciousness of like, yeah, I know, I know. It's you. You yeah. referenced it, Colgate. You meant toothpaste. That is fine. I will pass you the toothpaste. And yeah. we are fine. We don't need to get stuck in the it's semantics. I think <laughs> about oh. Actually, it's not Colgate, it's Glim. <laughs> like, do you want Glim? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's, I think once you, like the point of language is to really surpass it, I yeah. guess. Yeah. And then you, you won't really be wondering about the dog <laughs> anymore. <laughs> that's it. The dog is out of the question now. You, you have a direct communication with the energy. That's it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, wow. Cool. 